wonderful session on the theme of governance. Wherever you're joining from, we appreciate you making the time to connect with us. Uh, my name is Kelly Lee and I'm sitting here in Vancouver. I'm professor in Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University in Canada. And the focus of my, act, my work is actually global health governance. So I'm looking forward to hearing the speakers today. We're fortunate today to have four speakers uh, whose brief presentations is going to be on the theme of COVID-19 and governance. And it's a very broad term, as we know, very widely used and variably defined. So just to put it into context a little bit before we start uh, with the presentations, very simply put, governance is about the rules and processes by which an organization or a society collectively steers itself towards agreed goals. So in the context of COVID-19, governance is really at the heart of all societies spanning um, collective action from the local level to the global level. And it's about organizing ourselves to fight this virus. And, and so in this sense, governance is really at the heart of our success or our failure at, um, at this time. So if you think about governance in that way, as uh, for example, how authority is distributed across different parts of society, government markets and civil society, we can think about governance being about the relationship between political and public health leaders uh, and between leaders and citizens. And we can think about governance perhaps about who's invited around decision making tables and who's actually left outside of those uh, meeting rooms. So if you think about governance in those sort of broad terms, it will help you to understand what this uh, session is about. So six months in to this or so of this pandemic, and we can see that um, it's, I think it's very clear to everyone that issues of governance are really central to what's happened so far, how our societies are steering through this emergency. And no one's got it completely right, as we know. Uh, some societies have steered very well uh, relatively well, and so there are relatively low numbers of infections and, and deaths, thankfully. But other societies have experienced what we might describe as uh, erratic driving during this pandemic. So the quality of governance really matters, and this is why this session is being held. So, of course, in this very brief session, we, we can only scratch the surface, and there's a lot of research going on around the world on governance and COVID. Uh, I'll just name a couple of that of groups that, that can't be here today. There's a, there's a major gender and COVID-19 project being launched next week, funded by the Gates Foundation, led by Julia Smith, Claire Wenham, Rosemary Morgan. Um, there are reports by the OECD on principles of good governance and COVID uh, worth checking out. And of course, we know there's been an uh, international uh, independent evaluation of the COVID response launched um, or announced by WHO last week. So all of these things relate to governance and so really keep an eye on all these things and many, many other projects. So with that background, today we are very fortunate to be joined by four speakers who are working in this field, in this area, and they're going to briefly talk about their research and they've been asked to talk about three specific questions in the five minutes that they've been given. How will COVID-19 shape the social life of the communities that, that you, uh, they study? What challenges will their research encounter during the next 12 months? And how can funders maximize the impact of their research beyond offering additional funding? So they've been asked to, ask, to think about those questions. We've given five minutes for each speaker, and then I'm going to open it up to Q&A discussion uh, that, so that you can become involved. If you'd like to ask a question, as Kenneth was saying, I think it was Joao, um, if you want to make a comment, uh, please either put it put your um, intent in the chat box or perhaps raise your hands and I'll try very hard, Gail and I, to get to you and we'll get to as many people as possible in the time that we have. I do need to leave some time at the end for our rapporteur, which is uh, Professor Asha George. Otherwise, we'll be booted back into the main room and, and um, we wouldn't be able to hear from her. So I want to make sure keep an eye on the time. So with no further ado, I think we're spot on time. Um, I'd like to turn to my, uh, our first speaker, who is Professor Jane Duckett. Jane, uh, Professor Duckett is, Edward, is the Edward Care Chair of Politics and the Director of the Scottish Centre for China Research at the University of Glasgow. Uh, and her research uh, relates to researching the Chinese government COVID-19 containment measures and societal responses. 
So Pro Professor Duckett, over to you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've only got five minutes, so I'm not gonna uh, hang around. Um, yeah, I, I'm a political scientist who's worked for a long time on health policy and the health system in China from a political science angle. And this project, um, which started three months ago and is funded by the Medical Research Council and the National Institute for Health Research in the UK, um, tries to, is trying to understand exactly what the Chinese government's measures were in containing and mitigating the COVID-19 pandemic. So looking in, in great detail at both what the central government did and then trying to look at some local, the local variations that there were inevitably in a country as big as China across the country. And we're also interested in how, what the impacts of those uh, policies were on the society and how people responded to the policies. The first part of the project, the policy, the measures we're, we're doing through documentary research, which we're able to do because the Chinese government puts a lot of its policy documents online. So we're able to do a lot of that from here at the moment. Um, we will, we are hoping to, do field work in the future to, to actually look on the ground. But of course that's dependent on, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, access travel and all the, all, all the rest. In looking at the societal responses to um, the measures that governments introduced, we're, we're looking at social, because of the difficulties getting there at the moment, we're looking at social media data. So we're doing computational analysis of uh, social media posts in China over the period of the pandemic. Um, so we have an international team, political scientists mostly, um, quite a number of whom, there's altogether all 10 of us and uh, of which um, I think seven are Chinese uh, nationals, both in China and outside of China. Um, so early findings um, in the context of this governance, the governance panel today is, of course, there was a strong lockdown um, type response in China initially in the very early phases. And I think everyone knows that. I think it's interesting to reflect on how much, it will be interesting to reflect on how much that actually affected the responses of other countries around the world, right? The, the way the big lockdown became the, the thing to do. And I wonder, um, you know, had China taken a different approach, whether that would have really affected um, in a very different way how other countries responded. Um, the other thing to, uh, to know about the Chinese response was that it involved a huge mass mobilization of people and of party members and of officials and of employers and of you know, people across society, right down to the community levels, a highly interventionist um, and highly mobilized. Um, although using some technology, actually relying a lot more on very traditional uh, Chinese te Communist Party techniques of, it, of intervention at the right down into people's uh, you know, residential compounds. Um, we have found that the uh, Chinese authorities' response to, the, to recent outbreaks, the secondary outbreaks in, in Beijing, for example, in June, were much more targeted, still highly interventionist, still involving a sort of mass mobilization of people in particular at the, the, to, to sort of target and, and identify people who'd been to hotspot areas of the outbreak. Um, but then targeting restrictions on movement and so forth, uh, much more than they had done in the Wuhan outbreak. So how will COVID shape the lives of communities that I study? Um, we still haven't, we still haven't finished the social media analysis. We, we've seen a greater surveillance and monitoring of the health of the population uh, in residential areas and also in workplaces. So every employer, uh, teachers in schools, they are responsible for reporting the health of their the, you know, their, their employees, the children of the children in the nursery, for example, it's not just down to individuals and the same in communities as well. So community officials, you know, knocking on doors, asking people, checking on people's health on a regular basis. Um, there's also going to be a lot of uh, obviously the huge economic pro uh, problems, which we don't hear much about in China and which the government is trying to play down. But, you know, rising unemployment clearly, particularly amongst the informal workforce in China, which is very substantial these days. That's a big problem. In terms of the project, what challenges will we encounter in the next 12 months? Well, from our point of view, one of the issues is getting access into China and, and being able to, to look on the ground and talk to people, do interviews uh, in, in different parts of the country to look at both, to kind of retrospectively try and assess the impact of the, of the policies, but also to look um, at the longer term ongoing um, impacts because one of the concerns is that the that this has enabled a greater kind of control of the people's lives and that's going to continue post or post COVID. Um, then the final question was how can research funders maximize the impact of our research beyond uh, offering additional funds? For for us, I think the, the 
the, the big question really, the big thing that I would like to more help with personally is kind of getting some of our findings out to internationally, because I think we can, you know, we, our projects attracted a lot of attention in the UK. We've, I've been on the media talking about it and things, but actually what's most useful probably is for other developing countries or other countries in other parts of the world who may look to China for some of uh, what, they, what they want to do to understand the pros and cons of the Chinese approach. Okay, that's me. Perfect. Five minutes, spot on. Thank you very much. Not easy to do. Um, fascinating uh, project. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is um, Dr. Adam Camrat Scott. Um, Dr. Camrat Scott is from the University of Sydney, and he specialises uh, in global health security and international relations. So he's going to talk about his research specifically around. Um, uh, the IHR, but also the role of militaries in health emergencies. Over to you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Um, so, yes, there's uh, two research projects which are currently underway. One is at the end stage of completion. So this is the final year uh, for it to conclude, which is looking at the role of militaries in health emergencies. And that was previously focusing primarily on events like the Ebola outbreak and Zika and polio eradication. But understandably, COVID-19 has now uh, necessitated or in included a number of military forces being involved. And we've also been involved in a the new uh, research project which has been launched uh, in March this year um, through a funding call by the Canadian Institute for Health Research which is a two-year study looking at understanding compliance with the international health regulations. Um, that is a multinational team. Uh, it involves a series of uh, case studies, uh, including Canada, Australia, the United States, and Hong Kong. And there is a team of researchers um, involved in that project. Um, we were fortunate enough that we kind of were able to see that um, field work and travel would be quite uh, challenging in COVID. So the team and our case studies has been largely designed around where people are actually based. So I'm based in Canberra, which allows me to uh, conduct interviews here in Australia with uh, senior government officials. We have Kelly Lee in Canada. Um, we have Karen Greppen in Hong Kong and we have uh, Catherine Walsnop in the United States, uh, who is in Maryland, so close to Washington, DC. Um, in terms of uh, this, how COVID is shaping the social life, I think um, the, the key message really is that obviously everyone is still very much in the response phase. So all of the people that we're wanting to interview, um, whether it be um, government officials or for the second project looking at the role of militaries, um, we find that very much individuals are uh, very much still in the response phase. And so their priorities perhaps are understandably focused on, on responding to the pandemic. And so when we start to sort of approach individuals around, um, look, you know, we're wanting to understand compliance or compliance with a legal framework, they may not necessarily see that as a priority at the present time. But um, there is understandably a lot of interest nonetheless in the projects, um, particularly with regards to the policy impact. I think probably one of the big challenges that is going to be encountered over the next 12 months, uh, particularly with the military project, is that there was a lot of field work which was um, in the preparation or it was actually due to occur this year which has obviously been disrupted and so that's necessitated a change in the methodology um, with how uh, that research will be finalized. Uh, with the second project uh, because the case studies are based around the location of where research team members are located it makes it conceivably a little bit easier um, for them to be able to actually contact individuals and conduct interviews via remote means like Skype and a Zoom and, and other forums. But um, uh, access to stakeholders is going to be an ongoing challenge. Um, and how funders can maximise the impact. I think probably, um, as uh, Jane sort of mentioned, I think one of the key aspects is that researchers often are confronted with uh, trying to disseminate the research findings using their existing networks. And sometimes um, research teams can be very good at that. Uh, at other times they can face constraints, particularly in a global context. And with a lot of the sort of research around what we're looking at, um, conceivably it has applicability to global audiences. So the ability to sort of actually form partnerships with 
um, funding agencies to then help actually disseminate research is going to be really important. I think uh, I'll just finish off on one of these aspects, which is one of the challenges with the IHR compliance um, project. Um, I think probably one of the big challenges that we will confront, it is a two year project, um, but there are a number of policy discussions about, that are starting to emerge around revising the IHR, um, even as we're trying to track and understand compliance with it. And so that's going to be interesting to see how that will unfold over the next two years. Thanks. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, you're a very easy uh, group to manage. Um, our next speaker is Manja van Reinveld. And Manja is a researcher at the School of Public Health the University of Western Cape with a background in social anthropology and public health. And she's currently in the early stages of her doctoral studies, looking at the interface between grassroots COVID-19 response movements, collective action and state bureaucracies. Manya? Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to share some reflections and, and it's great to be with you all today. So, um, yeah, for the past five months and since the start of COVID in South Africa, I've been part of a grassroots social and community mobilization effort um, in, in my city in response to the pandemic, which is known as Cape Town Together. And it's, it's um, organized around these sort of neighborhood level community action networks, which we refer to as CANs, that are um, mobilizing and, and, and made up of ordinary people, residents um, of neighborhoods who come together to organize on the ground in response to hyper-local needs of, of their neighborhoods, of their communities. And it's a network that's been um, kind of crossed race and class and sp spatial divides in, in a very divided city like Cape Town. Um, hasn't received any real formal financial support either from the state or anyone else. There's no leadership structures. It's um, this horizontal network with as little bureaucracy as possible. Um, but what we've seen is that the network itself has generated a huge amount of its own knowledge in response to the virus, often in the form of, of lessons and stories and fact-checked advice and fake news alerts and, and things shared on social media and across, across the network, which we've seen as being incredibly value and far more diffused in, in its spread than some of the top-down behaviour change interventions um, that um, have been implemented by, by government, for example. So, one example of this is the way in which um, safety measures have been taken up in some of the community kitchens that the that the cans have set up, um, which would otherwise have become potentially massive transmission hotspots, but through particular ways of sharing information and ideas and learning, um, all of the can community kitchens have, have put in place a, a range of really functional and stringent safety measures to reduce the spread of COVID in their kitchens. So. What this network is, is um, I mean, as might be expected um, from a community-based response to the virus, most of the work done uh, within the network is governed by notions of, of collective protection and, and collective action and its principles like mutual aid and solidarity and the idea that no one is safe unless we're all safe that have been intrinsic to how the cans have responded to the pandemic. But for myself, um, where I, I work both within my own neighborhood local can but also work as a as an embedded health systems and policy researcher researcher and someone with, with links to the Department of Health and there are people in the network who are also employees of the Department of Health. The, the past five months or so have, have presented a really unique and important opportunity to try and bridge this discourse of solidarity and mutual aid coming from the community groups. Um, such as the CANs with, with the formal state response and its framing of the, of the pandemic. And a major focus from our side has been trying to influence and legitimize different kinds of data that get pulled in to inform decisions at a governance level, especially in order to push back against an overly hospice-centric approach and highlight the enormous burden of COVID-19 related care that is placed on the community health system through, for example, tackling food insecurity or evictions or gang related violence and drug use, all of, all of which is done with, with um, limited resources um, and in the context of COVID become fundamental parts of the response yet aren't necessarily seen as the mandate of um, a formal health system or Department of Health response to, to the pandemic. Um, and so through the CAN, we've generated a huge amount of frontline knowledge and data. And it's been our role as embedded researchers to encourage respect and listening and, and take up of this kind of learning. Um, there are, of course, huge power dynamics at play, as well as massive bureaucratic challenges and the kind of usual 
tick box um, community consultation that happens, but a massive, huge asset that's worked in our favor in this process has been some of the long-standing positive relationships that we've built um, as embedded researchers with Department of Health colleagues and policymakers. And as a result, the CANs have been invited into a number of collaborative spaces with the De Department of Health, and we've seen some important shifts from a dif discourse of individual control and personal hygiene responsibility and containment of the virus to a broader um, a discourse around collective protection and collective action as a result of the kind of community researchers that have been making these knowledge contributions that people that we're referring to as professors of the street. Um, in terms of um, a sort of fund from a funding perspective, five months now into this work, um, the fatigue is, is obviously setting in. It's been so far an unfunded voluntary um, network of people that a really big question, question that we're facing is how do you fund this kind of um, work given that it is not necessarily hypothesis driven or even bound by tangible traditional knowledge outputs determined at the onset of a research process. Um, what we've seen is that the knowledge contribution of, of the network and of this kind of embedded research is sometimes not even written down, yet it clearly finds its way into um, the discourses and framings of problems and solutions. Um, and yet, on the other hand, despite influencing the discourse in this way, we've been largely unsuccessful in, in shifting any actual flows of money or funding to support things like the community kitchens or other work that's being done within the cans. So I guess I'll close on the sort of question of from a funding point of view, how do you maximize the impact of this kind of non-linear, often informal diffusion of knowledge contributions? And we would argue strongly that this kind of work and embedded research of this nation needs to be funded over, over a long term in highly flexible ways and really requires thinking about um, both impact and accountability differently in the kind of funding model that is applied. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Manya. Okay, we're right on time. Um, our final speaker, our fourth speaker is Professor Fadi El Jardali. He's a professor of health policy and systems uh, at, at the University, uh, American University in Beirut, and the chairperson of the health policy management department, um, and many, many other things. Um, his research is focused, I believe, on knowledge translation, governance, and health systems. Over to you, Fadi. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, to, just wanted to, to start uh, uh, by, by mentioning that, uh, and I want to reflect more on the experience of the uh, uh, Middle East and North Africa region. I think that we've, we've have, we're actually generating a lot of interesting insights and lessons from, uh, 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 from how uh, governments are re reacting to COVID-19, uh, how, how research is being funded, and how, how research is being disseminated. So I just wanted to mention that, in fact, from a gov governance standpoint, uh, the pandemic exposed a lot of governance dysfunctions uh, uh, that exist or inherent in current system. And this is really quite clear in how government responded uh, and what type of policy measures that they have taken uh, in responding uh, uh, to the pandemic. We've realized that in fact, we, we really live in one world uh, where, where social inequality and equity issues will hurt everybody equally. And this is very clear uh, of what we have seen when it comes to access to healthcare services, in terms of coverage, in terms of social assistance, in terms of food supply, etc. So, so, so we're seeing a lot of dysfunctions of existing governance framework, but also we've seen some dysfunction of how we are actually producing research, how we're disseminating research, and how research is being used to inform to inform uh, uh, policy decisions. I want to go back, just respond briefly to some of the questions when it comes to how COVID-19 affected mostly the communities. We, we are now working, one of the things we've realized, particularly in the, in the context of the Arab world, that we didn't do a good job of helping communities to better organize themselves, to, help, to better work together in, uh, in the context of public health emergencies. So now we actually got funding, recent funding to start working in to strengthen the community-based approach and community resilience in public health crisis and what that means in reality. What that means in a, how to decentralize decision-making processes, how NGOs, municipalities, public health units, primary care centers, dispensaries, hospitals, all 
linked together because we strongly believe that you know winning the battle against COVID-19 is not by increasing capacities in hospital and ICU bed. It happens in the community, and this is where we need to spend more more efforts on helping communities organize themselves. Some of the key things we've learned that in our context, in our part of the world, uh, the the vulnerable population is being being hit very hard, uh, uh, you know, uh, including poor people. But in the context, for example, in Lebanon, we have the issues of refugees. We have we have uh, uh, we have critical, you know, issues related to refugees. We're starting to see parallel system. There is no equity in terms of how we're providing services from from PCR testing to tracing to isolation to accessing hospital. So we're seeing some some uh, again uh, some inefficiencies that exist in system. We're seeing more more uh, uh, domestic violence against women, and this is something you know also vulnerable people. We're seeing also more marginalized youth. Uh, uh, you're saying that you know there is a significant number of youth that is now unemployed. So all this actually uh, being impacted as a result of, and it's good to actually have to, to for social science to invest more research to understand uh, to understand those uh, those elements. On the on the uh, uh, on the knowledge production dissemination, we we all know Kelly. We all know that there is there's there has been traditional boundaries that exist between knowledge production, uh, 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 dissemination, and consumption. And I think we need to to start to rethink to rethink the model of uh, a production dissemination and use of that evidence. Uh, it, what it, it was clear in how government responded that there has been really challenges and barriers of how to actually produce or co-produce knowledge, how to best innovative method to disseminate, and how it's being used. That's why we see significant variation of how government responded to COVID. Not to say there was many of them were political decision, not necessarily evidence-based decision. And I know this is beyond the scope, but there's a lot can be said about, about also that interface between politics, uh, uh, science, and society. So, so, so I just wanted to, from, a, from the K2P perspective, so we have a center called Knowledge to Policy Center. We are a Dutch Open Operating Center for Evidence-Informed Policy and Practice. So we have, been, we have, we have uh, done the COVID uh, Rapid Response uh, Initiative. So we're starting actually to produce uh, real-time evidence to support policymakers uh, uh, in responding and shaping and informing uh, uh, their decision. Well, some, of the, some of the lessons learned is that the, the, uh, the, at the time of crisis, people, researchers get, get energized to produce research, and this is very important. But at the time of crisis, there is a lot, a lot of noise around research. There is a lot of editorial, a lot of commentary, a lot of, some of them are excellent, but the question is when you start to inform and shape decisions in, in governments, we need to make sure that there is a trusted source of evidence in countries and regions that can actually try to, to filter that evidence, that knowledge, and look at the ones that are really quite of high quality, peer reviewed, etc. So we're, we're starting to see some challenges, uh, some challenges uh, uh, related, uh, related uh, uh, to this. So the question is really how we can promote more a trusted source of evidence, and this is really mostly at the governance level, as well as the, uh, the uh, 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 more at the dissemination as well. We're starting to see, I think there is an opportunity that COVID pandemic created for us, that now governments starting to trust more experts. I think that's, that's something good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm more reflecting from my part of the world. We have been really struggling a lot to how to make sure, not to change political system, but how to make sure that evidence is used as one input into the, into the decision-making processes. We're starting to see a little bit much more trust in that. The question really how we can maintain, sustain this in order to integrate the public health expertise, health system expertise, social science expertise into the decision-making process. How to institutionalize the use of evidence at the time of crisis in government. It's still, unfortunately, it, it, it's happening in an ad hoc uh, format. So uh, when I end up by saying just more, we've learned a lot so far, uh, engaging and, and, and being, and, and activate a rapid response system uh, from the research enterprise, whether it's really at the university level, at the center level, is extremely important at the time of, uh, at the time of uh, crisis. Engaging them, working, and I'm happy to see more social scientists now trying to do more and more policy-relevant research 
that is really impactful. I'm seeing more researchers that are engaged more in the political domain. They understand more the policy context, and I think this is very, very important in terms of the of the engagement. So providing rapid response, being a trusted source of evidence at time of crisis is very critical at, 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 at this stage. The last point I want to mention about the funders. I think, I think, and I'm talking more, you know, the global south and the global north competition. And I tell you, we need to really rethink the funding model and the incentives and the reward model that exists. And we need to see more real, real cooperation between the global north and the global south. We would like to see more engagement and involvement of global south researchers, universities, working hand in hand with the global north in a model that is really rewarding for, uh, for both entities. I think we have to strengthen that cooperation and coordination and COVID-19 provide an excellent, excellent opportunities related to that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we've, uh, we've covered a lot of ground in 20 minutes for very short presentations, but I hope that everyone's getting a flavor of the, the rich uh, work that's going, around, going on around the world by social scientists. Um, and so thank you to our four speakers for sharing um, what, what they're doing in, in very different parts of the world. But what I found really interesting is that we covered community level uh, with Manya's work, uh, national level with Fadi and um, Jane's work, but also the global level. And what's interesting, maybe we could have a discussion about how those are interconnected because we're studying them at, at different levels but obviously we need to have this all come together at some point to, to inform us. Um, and the other issue I think that was raised was interesting was about the normative frameworks that are driving a lot of this governance work. Technical work's really important, um, interventions, a lot of the biomedical science that's going on, absolutely essential. But what we're studying about the, the frameworks, the political frameworks, normative uh, principles that are defining governance is really important. So I, I heard a lot of that from the four speakers as well. And dysfunction, I think one word was used. Um, we certainly have a lot to learn from this pandemic in terms of how our governance systems are working and are not working very well at this time. Um, at, at this point, we have about, ha I think we have a half an hour uh, uh, for questions, comments. What we're doing is trying to manage this through either you raising your hands or um, putting in your chat box. Uh, I see that Gail has put a message in about raising your hand or perhaps um, perhaps uh, putting a question in the chat box. So I'm going to try and manage that multitasking. Uh, it's very early in the morning here, so <laughs> it's not the best time of day for me to be multitasking, but I will do my best. I see there was one question to Jane that you answered already on in the chat box, but you may want to um, maybe be more fulsome in your in your uh, response. So the question was, would you please speak to the issue of access, sharing policies online? Is there a risk of excluding individuals who do not have access to online or digital platforms? This is an issue in sub-Saharan countries where some groups or individuals do not have access to these platforms. Very good question from Busi and Kosi. Uh, Jane, do you want to respond to that a little bit fuller? Sure, yeah. It, it's interesting because, yeah, the, the Chinese urban population is, is generally thought to be very online, very um, digitally connected, a, a lot of people, but you do still have a significant proportion of the Chinese population who are not so readily online. I think in, as from what we know about how policies were being communicated and measures being communicated with the um, with people in China uh, during the pandemic, it was a, they were using a lot of a lot of platforms. So there was a there was a heavy use actually of of WeChat, you know, sort of social media by the by the government by government officials. Uh, but they did do what I think a lot of countries I'm aware of also did was they had the regular TV press conferences every day, you know, sort of setting things out. Um, and there was information on on the web as well. Um, but what they also did use, as I alluded to in my presentation, was a, a lot of use of, of community activists, not, not ground, ground up activists, but really Communist Party members or people who are kind of quasi officials in the Chinese system who actually, you know, ensure that people in every residential compound, you know, are, are you know, are checked as they come in and out or their doors are knocked on. And, and so I think, I think in a sense, that kind of level of intervention, right, at the community level does mean that despite those, that digital divide, the most of the, the, the kind of key 
policies um, were being communicated reasonably effectively. That wasn't, you know, in fact, you know, um, in on a much, when we talk, I always say to my, you know, colleagues and friends um, in the UK, we talk about lockdown, but actually there's, you know, there's not someone standing at the end of the street telling you you can or can't leave, <laughs> you know, your street um, or your house as, as, as was often the case in, in China. So it's a, it's a different level of, of kind of community level, um, you know, um, residential area level um, uh, interventions in China. Thanks, Jane. Um, one of the things that I, um, that, that's really helpful. One of the things that uh, I've heard from across the four speakers is, um, I guess, challenges of doing research during this time. I mean, it's, it's difficult in some contexts um, generally, but how, has, how have you coped with that? And I've heard a little bit about, you know, um, not doing, being able to do field work, working through these more creative ways of getting data, either it's documents or social media or whatever sources. Uh, interviewing through Zoom, I imagine, as a lot of social scientists are doing at the moment. Do, do any of you have tips or um, suggestions for the researchers out there in terms of how to cope when you can't travel, when you, you know, maybe accessing uh, people that are very busy at the moment uh, in terms of governance research? Um, Adam, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I think, um, I guess one of the things that the pandemic is uh, creating and it's a there's obviously a diversity of um elements here or, or experiences but conceivably it allows us a little bit of time uh, perhaps on the sidelines to actually reconsider how the research is to be conducted so um, one of the key elements for instance with the project um on militaries in health emergencies uh, i was meant to be traveling to brazil uh, in May to conduct field work. Um, as it turns out, I have a colleague who's now been stuck in Brazil. Um, and obviously Brazil is not a great location to be stuck in at the moment um, due to the prevalence of the pandemic there. But um, equally, um, and this goes to um, Fadi's point, utilising a um, Global South scholars and starting to incorporate them in the research has, uh, even though that was on the cards previously, um, because there has been this need for reconsideration of things like field work and in person interviews for myself, um, I'm now reliant entirely on Global South scholars and collaborators to assist with that research. So um, I, I think if we can take the opportunity where possible to start to try and build some of those partnerships, um, this is conceivably a good opportunity. Obviously we need to be really conscious that we're not putting anyone at risk in the process. Um, and so there's certainly um, big considerations there to um, be mindful of, but um, there are opportunities, I think as well in the midst of this to actually start to build more partnerships conceivably than what we had um, done before. That's great. Um, I, I should have reminded maybe all the speakers to put their cameras on and then you can jump in. We're trying to have a discussion rather than a cue and, you know, back and forth. So if you guys want to put your cameras on, uh, Fadi and Manya, thank you so much. Then everybody can see us um, as a sort of virtual panel. Um, so do do send your questions in and or raise your hands. I'm, I'm furiously checking. <laughs> uh, any, anything else on tips for social science researchers out there who are struggling to keep their their work going? Anything um, uh, of, of use do you think from your own experience? I would de definitely echo um, what Adam just said about working with with colleagues you know in, in you know in, in, in countries around the world global south or, or however you'd like to um, to call it um, you know our project has got it's been really, really valuable to have members of our project actually based in China through this. We, we, we applied for the money with um, jointly with and, and ensured that we had some Chinese colleagues, some based in the UK, but some in China. And that's been able, been able to give us at least some of something of a feel um, for, for how things are working on the ground there. Um, so I think uh, even if we haven't been able to get there ourselves, so that's important. I think, you know, it, it, there are other difficulties around, you know, we, we've just found that, you know, so sort of we've had huge technical issues around well not huge yeah yeah pretty pretty we've, we've managed to overcome them but technical issues around you know the technologies for for getting everyone to 
to develop, uh, you know, our coding frames for our policy documents and our social media data analysis. You know, it just seems much more laborious trying to do that with online with Zoom meetings, you know, to try and, you know, rather than getting everyone in the room to sort of, you know, because you can't sit in a room, you can sit in a room for, 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 a, for a whole day and, you know, have, you know, have breaks with lunch and stuff, but you can't really do that with Zoom and it's just kind of uh, been very, kind of feel, it kind of feels harder to get, to, to get everyone understand, you know, the same understanding of what, what you're trying to do and how, how, how things work. Um, so sort of training up members of the team who didn't have the sort of experience of doing some of the coding um, just seemed harder work um, when we're all sitting in different rooms, whether it's in China and here or whether it's in different parts of Glasgow, you know. Um, so that was my, that's been my experience. So maybe one of the good things about COVID will be that we're, we're you know, thinking about our working meaningfully with collaborators in country, which would be a good thing, of course, um, rather than um, um, some of the practices that we've had in the past. So I have a hand up from Cheru. Is that right? Jump, jump right in. Oh. On that. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, man, yeah. before we move on to a new topic, which I assume of course. we might be but just to oh, say. Sorry, Cheru, just a minute. Um, Manya was going to jump in quickly. Um, I guess as a from the perspective of a Global South researcher, um, also working in a, in a very localized way right now. So all of this work is kind of focused in on the city and at most the province. Um, one of the things that I guess we found has been tapping into many of the pre-existing partnerships, similarly, I suppose, to what you were saying, um, Adam, but uh, the, the, the network of, of knowledge sort of dissemination platforms that have been really, really helpful um, for us has, have, most of them have been pre-existing, um, things like Health System Global and, and various local collectives of researchers that we have here that have kind of kicked into action to help a lot of this work get out. But one of the other interesting things that we found has been the power of writing in the media. And so, you know, there are a lot of like local um, newspaper outlets in, in, in South Africa that much of our thinking and work, which is also emerging as we go along, has been published in sort of as, a, as opinion pieces or whatever. And we're finding that there's, a, um, that there's a, almost more uptake of that kind of um, 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 output right now, it's probably because people have not a lot of time to be reading pages and pages and pages of journal articles, but maybe do have time to kind of scan through the headlines on the Daily Maverick or whatever. So that's been a really important part of how we've um, tackled this. That's, that's an excellent point. We've got the ear of the media for sure at the moment. They are um, continually looking for, for um, findings to report. So, so we should use that. Charu, sorry to cut you off there. Um, did you want to have a jump in yeah, on the no, conversation? No problem. Fascinating discussion. So I guess uh, not being a social scientist, I'm a biomedical researcher. Uh, I'm intrigued by how the uh, the pandemic has played out in different countries and different governance structures. You know, it, it appears that it's much more important to have harmony between the political and the public health messaging, regardless of uh, what kind of uh, governance structure there is in different countries, you know, rather than having uh, more democratic societies because GDP and democracies, you know, have not correlated with how well the, uh, uh, the outcome of pandemic is being uh, dealt with. So, uh, you know, so uh, some thoughts around what's more important in terms of the messaging and the harmony that needs to be there in governance structures and I guess the second part of that would be to say, you know, how has WHO as an external body uh, played a role in those kind of messaging, uh, you know, in, in different governance structures. So this may not be very, I'm not speaking social scientist language, but I was just kind of curious to see what uh, people thought about that. Okay, um, I see Fadi's put his hand up and you might have prompted some, some interest there. Fadi, did you have a comment on that point? Do you want to put your camera back on? I think I think Leanne has a, a has a point. I think she has to make before oh. my question. All right. Uh, is, is it related to Charu's point about harmony and the working relationship between political leaders and public health leaders? Leanne. It was more Thanks. connected to the previous point, actually. So Fadi, perhaps you should go first if yours is more connected to Charu's point. <laughs> sure. So, so I just. Uh, I just wanted to, to uh, more, more uh, uh, reinforce
reinforce the message about uh, uh, two points. The first is that we need, we are now, we are, uh, uh, we have an opportunity. There is a lot of, of social science type of questions uh, uh, that needs to be answered. And the, certainly the pandemic is providing an opportunity to invest in this type of priority research. This being said, the, the, the type of questions that need to be asked, but also the type of methods, the research methodology, I know this is beyond our discussion in this group, uh, uh, but certainly the setting of how we're gonna conduct uh, this type of research during pandemic. So for example, in our contact Lebanon now, we're really engaging very much with all the NGOs, with the municipalities, with volunteers, with public health students, in order to engage them, take into consideration social distancing measures and all, all uh, uh, safety measures. So these are things that we need to learn. We don't have a perfect way of doing it, but I think there's, there's, it's important to invest in new way of conducting research at the time, uh, a time of crisis. The second point I want to mention, again, going back to the funders, I, 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 I do believe that, in fact, conducting and answering social science questions at the time of pandemic required a new way of thinking about funding and how we can build a new model, innovative model, uh, a reward model even, that would allow to conduct research uh, with, with, uh, with sufficient cooperation, coordination, engagement. There's a many, uh, many, uh, uh, many actors that we need to engage uh, with, whether the private sector, the NGO, the, the international association, humanitarian aid agencies, etc. So there is a, there, there, we need to rethink also how an incentivized research to conduct research at the time of crisis, but having the right model, the existing model, uh, I worry that it might not be fit now in the COVID and the post COVID-19 era. Over. Thank you. Yes, there are challenges of doing emergency social science research. I don't think I've ever <laughs> been in such a situation where you have to do it so quickly. Um, when our research is often you know, it takes time. It takes time to build relationships and so on. Um, before we get back to Charu, um, I think there's a, Leanne, you did want to, to build on Manya's point about methodology, didn't you? So why don't you jump back in again? Thank Thanks you. so much. And it actually connects to, to Fadi's point as well. And I guess what I wanted to say is that um, the kind of linear assumptions about the pathways through which research influences policy obviously need to be challenged, right? And as kind of social scientists, I think that's something we're all quite familiar with. But what we've seen in this moment, I think, is diffusion of knowledge in different ways, um, in ways that are really quite valuable to the overall response. And I think that has been enabled through some embedded researchers in the system, actually, that do kind of link and collaborate quite closely with senior decision makers in at least the Western Cape Provincial Department of Health. And these are long-standing relationships that have existed for a decade or so, of which myself and others are part. I'm part of the team that um, Manya spoke about earlier, by the way. And so I, I guess, like Fadi, I absolutely agree, new ways of thinking about how we do these forms of research are absolutely critical. And I think what we've been able to see, although we haven't sort of done, I guess, the traditional research um, maybe in, in this time. We haven't, I mean, all of us have been already in the field, so to speak, as part of our jobs, you know? And so the, the kind of the, we haven't been, as, as some of the other speakers have spoken about, wondering how to continue doing the work of an existing project. We've been out there collecting evidence and generating, co-producing forms of knowledge every day with community activists as embedded researchers, but that network has also linked into the Department of Health itself. And so as an example, some of us, I mean, as Manya said, have been invited into spaces in the department to help to generate some ideas for responses to COVID, but have also been sort of invited onto, I guess, committees that are, that are designing the comms um, for, the, for the province, for example. And so quite, quite kind of un unusual ways in which um, I guess people have been invited into the province to participate in some of these uh, response um, approaches that are both rooted in the community experiences, but led by the state. And it's certainly not easy. It's very, very messy. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that has been enabled by longstanding relationships between embedded researchers who have worked with senior policymakers and managers in the health department for many, many years. And so the message to funders would be to fund that sort of research that's not necessarily, um, I guess, connected to out specific outputs, 
but that recognizes the kind of interconnected ways in which knowledge is produced and used in a time of crisis that builds on what has come before. Uh, thank you. Over. Thank you, Mian, for that. That's an important, those are important points. I've just had a blue message. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's five minutes left already. I didn't uh, realize the time had gone so quickly. So I want to give um, Asha George an opportunity to, um, as rapporteur, uh, in order to get us to get shot back before she has her comments. She, Asha is professor in the School of Public Health, University of the Western Cape in South Africa, and her background is in international relations, public health and development. Um, Asha, you, I think you have five minutes, <laughs> so hopefully you won't get cut off. I do apologize. Sure. So I think I have some time also to pull my thoughts together before we go into the next session. But I wanted to thank all the panelists. Um, Kelly started with a definition of governance that outlined that it looks at, you know, rules, processes, how, organize, uh, how society is organized in a collective endeavor. And uh, Fadi, you know, that's a very, I, she talked about how relationships are key between different stakeholders, who's at the table and who's left out, and the quality of governance matters. And I thought it was bookended by Fadi's comments, because those were sort of the ideal definition of good governance, and then the actual reality in some places of the dysfunctions that we're saying, and that governance plays a critical role. Um, so some initial thoughts of why this is an important area of work. It is about relationships, trust, power dynamics, and is sort of the glue as to why things are un ultimately implemented and stick or not. Um, I think we had some interesting examples. Also, two contrasting presentations in a way, one from China, which is looking at the national response, but really how that filters down to the community level, but also in a way that's organized by the Communist Party caters and systems, at, which is heavily overlain by a sense of community surveillance that is top down and contrasting that very uh, huge contrast with Cape Town, the Together initiative, which is an informal bottom up response to the pandemic. So two very different community based responses in terms of how they're organized um, and how they relate to the state and what are the relationships there? And I think we didn't have a chance to, while there have been some successes in Cape, Cape Town in changing the discourse, influencing decisions, it hasn't unlocked resources and it's still a very mar working with people who are very marginalized. Um, so there's that contrast. And then I thought Adam also had very interesting insights to share in terms of um, looking at key st different stakeholders, who's at the table, looking at the role of military in the response. It's not an actor that we normally think of, but I remember at the beginning of lockdown here in South Africa, it was also um, the radio announcements preceded was sort of the deployment of the military. So we knew something big was going to happen. So uh, it is an opportunity to look at some of these stakeholders we don't usually consider. There was also, Kelly, I'm not looking at time, various discussions about the form of knowledge, how we produce knowledge and disseminate knowledge, and looking at um, the challenges of fieldwork, but how that ties into an opportunity to do things differently, um, to look at the power relations within research itself and who we are as a research community. So Global North and Global South, what are the kind of partnerships we have? but also how we link with uh, policymakers and community members to co-produce research. And a key thing is even though we're doing this all online, relationships still matter. And that's at the heart of governance. Um, Pre-existing relationships for people who are very busy, for them to prioritize speaking to you, it, that pre-existing relationship, that sense of trust. And Fadi talked about um, uh, not just evidence, but trusted sources of evidence are so important in, in the COVID pandemic. So I don't know where we are with times. So those are initial reflections and I'll try and articulate them um, uh, with more detail uh, when we come back to the main plenary. And open that, to any wonderful. other comments. That's wonderful. And I look forward to those further comments in the plenary. Uh, I'm, I've got a little clock. Oh. 
He's just said five minutes now. So, okay. <laughs> he panicked us and we jumped to you, Asha. So, so at least we got you in there and you didn't get cut off. So that's great because I know that Adam wants to say something else. And I guess just going back to Charu, because her point was left hanging there about, you know, there's countries, um, we're going to be comparing and learning lessons from each other on, you know, wh what's the best way to have that relationship between public health and um, political leaders. And some countries have had a very um, harmonious, as, as Charu put it, uh, relationships. And I don't think they're exclusively non-democratic countries. Um, others have had less harmonious, as we know. So, you know, this is a public health emergency, but it's also a governance emergency. It's a very much showing which political systems are kicking into place, you know, who, who has the, the capacity to kind of mobilize quickly um, gain trust and so on. Adam, um, you had a comment, a slightly different one, but I want to get that in in our three minutes and 51 seconds left. Sure, yeah, look, I I think um, just on Shari's point, the governance structure is an interesting one. I am spending a bit of time reflecting on the differences between Australia's approach and the United States. Both countries are federal structures and yet we're seeing vast different um, responses, but um, perhaps that's a, something that we could take offline. I get I, there was just a, a really quick point that I wanted to sort of more of an appeal, I guess, um, and to sh people like Sharu um, that I think there's a real need for the social sciences to also be supported by the STEM and the hard sciences, um, particularly around funding agencies and the need for it. Um, and I think there's a really important element here and a good example is like everyone is understandably very focused at the moment on developing vaccines and everyone, every country at the moment and every government wants to be seen to be finding the vaccine. But um, how much resources are we actually putting into looking at the problem of vaccine hesitancy? Um, and that's going to be quite critical on the other side of once we've got the vaccine um, is how do we then not only do we how do we distribute it equitably um, and uh, and ethically, but also how do then we deal with the problem of, of vaccine uptake from communities that may be resistant to it. So there's aspects like that, which I would hope uh, like as, as an appeal as um, that we would see more support from the hard sciences, particularly when there is this opportunity for voices. Um, we're all in this together. Over. That's a that's a great way to end. Um, uh, I was going to say that social sciences are traditionally not that um, not involved very much in this kind of research, and so in a way we're exceptional um, trying to get into this space and you know working in it. We all know as social scientists how hard it is to get policymakers to listen to social scientists, um, and especially during public health emergency. So we have an opportunity here to really contribute, and we're showing that we're hopefully you know getting this um, the this evidence into policy because it, it's essential, and I think we're you know, a great example of the vaccine uh, distribution and global public goods and so on. So I think it's really important as all the social scientists and all the biomedical scientists on this um, conference that we, we um, you know, we need to bring that, that knowledge together and we're not quite there yet, I think. Uh, but thank you so much. I wanted to thank the speakers who um, gave their time. We're sitting all over the place in the world, uh, crazy hours. Uh, thank you for for sharing your experience. You're all very established researchers and, um, and very experienced at, at, uh, at a time when it's very difficult to do this kind of research. So I thank you. Asha, thanks for those comments. I really appreciate those and look forward to hearing more from you in the next session. I believe we're gonna get um, flung back into the plenary in about 30 seconds, and then there'll be uh, a break at some point, but I think that they'll explain that to you. But I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, for this session. It's been great, and I'm sorry if I haven't got to some of the comments um, that, that we're, we have in the chat box, but I appreciate your participation. So with that, I think we mm -hmm. have a countdown. You. you can see the clock at the top there. Is that right? Thank you for moderating, Kelly. You're very welcome. I had the easy job compared to you guys. So that's great. And if you, um, I believe there are recordings of the other sessions. So if you're interested in seeing those, um, they, they are available as well. Okay, I'll see you guys on the other side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.